All right, how you doing tonight, boys and girls? Today we're taking a look at lesson four, six to four, seven, where we're working with isosceles and equilateral triangles. Now, as you can see from the diagram on the right, there's a lot of triangles in that thing. So, how many do you think there are? Can you count them all? We'll find out soon and see if you got the correct number of them. Now, when you're done, of course, don't forget, you've got to make sure that you finish the two questionnaires, one on four, six, and one on four, seven, that they're at the web address that are displayed on your screen. Now the first thing I want you to do is write down this acronym CPCTC. That stands for congruent parts of congruent triangles are congruent. That should already be in your notes at some spot earlier from this chapter but just in case you don't have it there it is one more time again. Alright so as we can see from our diagram we're going to have side AD congruent to side DC because both of those have one hash mark and the other side AB is going to be congruent to side CB because both of those have two hash marks. So both of those statements have the reason given which you can see here from our two column proof we've got statements written down and we've got two reasons for each of those. Now on to our third reason and as you probably guessed by now you can see that BD is going to be congruent to itself because that side is shared by both of the two triangles. So those two triangles share that same side so that's going to allow us to write BD is congruent to BD because of the reflexive property of segment congruence. Alright so now that we've got all three sides of the triangle congruent to the corresponding sides of the other triangle, we can go ahead and say that the two triangles are going to be congruent by the side, side, side congruence postulate. Now so for our last step we're just going to show that A and C are congruent because they're corresponding parts of congruent triangles. So our statement is going to be angle A is congruent to angle C and our reason is going to be corresponding parts of congruent triangles are congruent. Now depending on who your teacher is, your teacher might allow you to just write CPCTC. Now I know on a lot of the standardized tests you won't see that written as CPCTC and you may actually have to write out corresponding parts of congruent triangles are congruent. So let's go ahead and take a look at our second example. Now in example number two we've got to explain how we can prove that LK and PN, those two segments, are congruent. First piece just says that NM and KM are congruent because that's given. We can tell by the little hash mark that's there for each one of them. And then the second thing we can tell from our diagram are that N and angle N and angle K are right angles. So those two pieces of information are given. What is it that we know about all right angles? Well, all right angles are 90 degrees and all right angles are congruent. So we're going to use that, that piece of information to write our next step. So that would look just like this where we say angle N is congruent to angle K because a reason all right angles are congruent. Now let's take a look at what we've got right here. We've got an angle and a side of one triangle congruent to the angle and side of another triangle. Now what I want you to look at is right in here in this little spot right here. This piece and this piece they're always going to be congruent because those are vertical angles. So we can say that each one of those angles are congruent. Our reason is going to be either the vertical angles theorem or you might write out all vertical angles are congruent. So hopefully you're following along so far we've got those two angles are going to be congruent because of the vertical angles theorem. Now if I go ahead and add that part in where those two angles are congruent so I'm just going to kind of write that right there and then right over here for this triangle. There it's kind of easy to see because in the top triangle you can easily see it's ASA and in the bottom triangle we can say the same thing it's ASA. So that's going to allow me to prove that my two triangles are congruent by ASA. And that means if I have two triangles congruent then I can go ahead and say that the LK piece is going to be congruent to PN because corresponding parts of congruent triangles are congruent. So hopefully you've kind of seen a little bit of pattern here in the first two examples. More or less it boils down to two things. One, interpret the diagram and write down the given information. Two, prove the two triangles are congruent and then our third thing, so there's actually three things, not just two, but our third thing is going to be to go ahead and show that that two pieces are congruent because of the corresponding parts of congruent 
triangles are congruent. So those are the three pieces you're going to have to do for all types of proofs that you see like this. Now let's take a look at our old friend here, Mr. Isosceles Triangle. Now the Isosceles Triangle is going to have two legs that it's going to stand on. And at the top, where those two legs come together and share that common vertex, that's going to be called, that's right, the vertex angle. And the vertex angle is going to be this angle that's right up in here. So that spot right in there, that's going to be our vertex angle. Now the other two pieces that we're going to take a look at, we're actually going to take a look at the bottom parts. We have two legs and the other side of the triangle that's not one of the two legs, that's going to get its own name too. And that's going to be called the base. And not only do we have the base, but we're also going to have the base angle. So this angle right over here and this other angle over here, those two angles are going to be called the base angles. And notice we've got three angles. We've got a vertex angle and we have two base angles. All right, so that's going to be part of the components that make up Mr. Isosceles Triangle. So the first thing we're going to take a look at is what's called the base angles theorem. Now the base angles theorem says, hey, you know, if you have two sides of a triangle and they're congruent, well, then the angles opposite them are congruent. So really, if we take a look at our picture here, we can kind of see we're given this information right here. These two hash marks mean they're congruent, so that's going to mean the sides opposite them are going to be congruent, which is angles A and C. Now, not only is that true, but so is its converse. That's right. If we start out with two angles of a triangle that are congruent, then the sides opposite them are also going to be congruent. So if we have A and C congruent, that means the sides that are opposite them, they're going to be the same, which is denoted by the hash marks and the other diagram. So both of those pieces play into a lot of what we're going to do when we take a look at diagrams involving Mr. Isosceles Triangle. Now, in addition to Mr. Isosceles Triangle, we also have the Equilateral Triangle. That's right, because if we have three sides that are the same, then we're going to be give, able to deduce certain other information. So that gives rise to two other corollaries that we've got here. First is the corollary of the Base Angles Theorem, where we say if a triangle is equilateral, then it is equiangular. Equiangular, equiangular. That's right. If three sides are the same, then that means three angles are the same. Now, it has its own corollary. So we've got a corollary to a corollary, it almost seems like. But all we need to know is that, hey, look, if we have a triangle that's equilateral, equiangular, 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 all three angles are the same, then that means that the triangle is going to be equilateral. So those are a couple of theorems and corollaries to some theorems, and we're going to play around and actually apply both of those in our next couple of examples. So here we are in examples three and four, and we've got to find the value of x. That's right. So what we need to do is take a look at our picture and deduce certain information. Now here we see two angles that are 60 degrees, and I see a side that is 16 and a side that is x. Now what I want to do is kind of take a look at, well, what's the side opposite this 60 degrees? Well, that would be x. And the side opposite the other 60 degrees, that would be 16. Well. If we have two angles in a triangle congruent, then that means the sides opposite them are congruent. So 16 is going to be the length of side x. Now in, in example number four, you guys probably have this one down by now. So go ahead and write an equation. Here's the tricky part with this. Sometimes, depending on the way the triangle's inverted, they're going to try and trick you and say, oh, 5x plus 5 is equal to either 17 or 35. And you've got to be able to look at that diagram and know which one of those two numbers to set that expression equal to. Do you know which one it is? Go ahead and write down what you think your equation is and then pause it and see if you got it correct. So how did you do? Did you set 5x plus 5 equal to 35? If you did, good job. Give yourself a pat on the back because you're a rock star, but you already knew that. If you didn't, well, you're a rock star in training, so you got a little bit of work to do, but that's all right. You'll get it. What you want to do is make sure you set 5x plus 5 equal to 35 because those are the two sides that are across from the congruent angles that are notated in your diagram. So there's your equation, and that's how you solve it. You guys, I'm sure, did fine with that. So now let's go ahead and take a look at example number five. Now this one's got two variables in it. I've got an X and I've got a Y. So what we're going to have to do is again interpret our diagram. We've got one angle's 90 degrees. And then I've got these other two angles that are X degrees and nine Y degrees. But 
check this out. If this is 90 degrees, then that means angle X and angle 9Y, their sum has to be 45. But in addition to that, I've got these two sides that are also congruent, which means the angles opposite them are congruent. So X and 9Y, those two angles have to both add up to 90, and they both have to be the same, which means that they're both 45 degrees. So X is going to be 45. That one's pretty straightforward and easy to figure out. But that also means the 9Y angle, that angle is going to be 45 degrees. So when I solve for Y, if I do my division correctly, I'll end up with 5 for the value of Y. So that's all there was to that problem, too. No big deal. You got this. Now here comes the fun one. Here comes example number 6. Check out this guy. I know looking at this picture makes me nervous too, but what we're going to do is pick it apart and go with the information that we already know. So let's take a look at this. I'm going to kind of take a look at two triangles here. I'm going to take a look at this guy first because this is the only one that has a number in it. Now, in that vertex angle at the very top, I see that I've got 50 degrees. Now, there are several different ways and several different approaches you can use to solve this problem. For the 2y plus 64 to figure out what that is I'm only going to give you one of them if you have a different technique that works for you that's fine just make sure you write an equation and that you can justify your reasoning here's the reasoning that we're going to play with here first thing I know is that the angle I'm given is 50 degrees that means if I have 180 minus 50 that's going to give me 130 degrees left between the other two angles now both of those angles are across from two sides that are congruent, which means they're going to be the same. Now, you could think about that like, okay, so I have 130 degrees left, and I've got to split that between two different angles. So I could divide that by 2. When I divide 130 by 2, I end up with 65. So one way you could think about this is say 2y plus 64 equals 65. And then when I solve this using my subtraction property of equality I'll get 2y equals 1 and y will only end up being just 1 half but here's what I want you to pay attention to this angle right here was 65 and so was this other one over here and if I add all three angles up I do get 180 so that's what I want to make sure I pay attention to so that's how we solve for y I mean so we went ahead we figured out the value of y and we're we're good with that but now we've got this x part over on the other side. 45 minus x over 4 degrees. Wow, that's a lot of stuff in there. So now I'm going to switch gears with the triangles, and I'm going to look at our second triangle over here. Now in this triangle, I've got two sides that are the same, which means two angles are going to be the same also. Now again, here's where we're going to kind of play around with the triangle first here that's in blue, because I know this angle is 65 degrees so this angle over here on the other side of 65 degrees because these two right here are going to make a linear pair if they make a linear pair then I can work with that green triangle and figure out what's going on in over there so I'm going to have 180 minus 65 and that's going to give me 115 degrees so that means this angle right here is 115 that's pretty cool. Now that I know that, I can find the other two angles. Now, so in that triangle that's in green, we've got 150 degrees for that one angle, that one vertex angle. So that means between the other two angles, I've got 65 degrees. But this angle right here, the 45 minus x over 4, that's not going to be equal to 65 degrees itself because that and the other equal angle have a sum of 65 degrees. So I actually have to take half of that 65 degrees and that's going to give me 32.5 or 32 and a half. So that's what 45 over x minus 4 is going to end up being. I think I kind of figured it out here. So if I have 32.5 degrees equal to my 45 minus x over 4. So there's a couple of different ways you can get started to, to go ahead and solve this. What I'm going to start with is, is by subtracting 45. All right, so if I did my arithmetic correctly, I end up with negative 12.5 equals negative x over 4. Now, this is where you have to be careful. Don't forget the negative sign on the negative x over 4 piece. 
To get rid of this on the right hand side, this fraction, I'm going to multiply both sides by negative 4. That's going to allow on the right hand side, that's going to cancel out the 4's and also the negative side is going to be gone as well. So when you're done, you should just end up with 50 for your value of x. So if you did all of your arithmetic correctly and you're multiplying and everything, you should end up with 50 for the value of x and y equals 1 half for the other variable. Now let's take a look at our puzzle again because we haven't taken a look at that for a while. So let's kind of see how you guys did with that. Now don't forget, we had a lot of things going on in this puzzle. 13 triangles is the correct answer for this. You have the six red triangles which are pretty straightforward and they're easy to see. You've got the three white triangles and they're easy to see too. But I'm going to go ahead and outline one of them here where you've got the three red with a right, white center. So here's one of them like this. So that's one of them and then you've got two more right down here. One's like that and then our last one is over here like this. So those are going to be the three red with the white center triangles and of course you've got the entire big triangle for four um, for the entire piece so that gives you a grand total of 13 triangles hopefully you can see it now if you didn't see it before now don't forget go ahead and do the questionnaire that you're required to do all right that's it for today boys and girls and i will see you again in class very very soon have a great day peace